Call the meeting to order of the CB Fiber Governing Board meeting for January 2019. Are there any additions to or changes to the agenda? I just want to give a very quick report about discussions with Washington Electric Co. Uh, okay. Okay, that sounds good. Anything else? Okay. Uh, any public comments? Any comments on items that are not on the agenda? Okay. Uh, treasurer's report. Becca. Yeah, two seconds. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Or if you want to start. Are you good or do you want to go on the other side of Chris's presentation? Um, I can go now. I was just okay. pulling it up on the computer. Mm -hmm. So. Um, okay, so as of today, um, in addition to the initial 125 put into the, um, we've received $4,009.89. So. Did you repeat $4,009.89. And there's some, um, I didn't calculate what the fees were out of that, but, um, because the online donations take a cut. So. And with that, um, with the, the advertising that I did on Facebook right towards the end of the year, did that result in anything at all aside from we got some board members? Uh, one donation that wasn't a board member. Okay. On the 31st. I think I know, I think I know who that is. Yeah. Okay. Um, any questions for Bethany? Okay. Chris, it is it is all you. Wow! And I will let you uh, <laughs> introduce yourself. Yeah. Okay. Tell us uh, what's what. Great. Uh, give me just a sec here. Let me uh, just sure. set this up. And um, you well here. Good thanks. Chris, would you rather switch places with me so you're over here? Um, you know, actually, given the fact that I, I seem to be at an angle. For okay. Everybody, why don't I just why don't I just do it right here? Yeah. That's it. Okay. Hi. <clears throat> um, some of you know me, some of, some of you know me, some of you may not. Um, uh, my name is uh, Chris Campbell. Um, I'm a principal consultant with uh, Tilson Technology Management. Um, we are um, a, uh, a company that does uh, telecommunications uh, consulting and network services. Um, just as a way of a personal introduction, um, I'm uh, a resident of uh, Montpelier, um, so sort of uh, whichever uh, direction this conversation goes tonight, you know, I'm, I'm uh, I think this is an interesting project, and I, you know, looking forward um, to its uh, to its success. Um, um, my background, um, I spent about 20 years um, working in various roles, mostly in uh, telecommunications and technology um, for the state of Vermont before joining Tilson. A good chunk of that time was spent um, with the Public Service Department. The last uh, five years was um, spent at um, the Vermont Telecommunications Authority before that was folded back into the Public Service Department. Um, and uh, we did a number of things there, but I, you know, one of the, the um, things that I think is a little bit relevant to this conversation is uh, worked um, with EC Fiber on a model that actually allowed the VTA and, and EC Fiber to collaborate on the pieces of their network that the state funded and built it and now are, are integrated into the network that they use to serve their communities. Um, so I think that was actually something I'm particularly proud of because before I came on board, the, the organization had an EC Fiber had kind of a fraught relationship and we managed to, you know, to, 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 to put something together that, that actually allowed people to work together. Um, that's, I think, emblematic of, of uh, a lot of my approach in, you know, in working in a public sector um, environment. Since then, uh, for the last uh, four years or so, I've, I've been at Tilson. Um, and what I'd like to do today is um, introduce you um, a little bit to the company, um, what it does, um, uh, and in particular, the um, broadband consulting work um, that's the part of the company that, um, that I work for. Um, and um, talk a little bit um, about um, how we work typically with organizations like yours that are um, looking at some form of, some form of uh, municipal broadband uh, project. Um, also, though, I want to I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, yeah, sort of my understanding of some of the I think 
particular hurdles that a Vermont Communications um, Union District faces in getting off the ground, and um, some thoughts about uh, maybe some different ways of, uh, of perhaps working together that, that address um, some of those hurdles. Um, feel free um, to stop me at any point um, if you have questions. You don't need to, to, to save them to the end. And I also want to point out that our agenda is rather short tonight. So if we go beyond the, the scheduled 30 minutes that um, is according to what's in here, it's really no problem whatsoever. So please ask any questions that, that you might have. Don't worry about the mic. OK, great. Um, let me actually put this on the slideshow. <coughs> Okay, so one of the things I like to say about Tilson is that um, who we are, we are both of these guys, right? Um, so we actually um, have quite a significant, actually the, the, you know, the biggest part of the business is, is actually in working for entities who are building, designing and building um, uh, networks. So we do a lot of, of work both in fiber uh, but also wireless. Um, we do a range of things from engineering, pole attachments, um, site acquisition, um, uh, construction, um, uh, maintenance, and, and pole ownership. Um, we also have a consulting um, a part of the business um, where um, we, do, we do work for you know, people who um, are perhaps looking to own networks or looking to fund them is uh, oftentimes what I would um, say. So we do you know, a variety of um, engagements that range from you know, broad planning to feasibility studies um, to when we work for some public agencies, we do broadband program design and implementation. And we also do you know, technical, technical audits, audits um, after um, networks are, are built and funded. It's a rapidly growing company. Um, we've quadrupled in size um, since I've been at the company. Um, we've been on the, um, the Inc. 5000 for seven, at least seven years running in a row, um, which is pretty unusual. Um, and uh, the company is headquartered um, in, um, in Portland, Maine, uh, but we have 17 offices nationwide, um, which is actually a significant expansion since I've been there. <clears throat> Um, so broadly, you know, we do work in telecom network services, and, and the work that we do there is really broad ranging. Um, <clears throat> a big chunk of the um, investment that's being, being, being made in telecom in the U.S. today is being in 4G and 5G networks, and so we're doing a lot of work um, um, in that space. But we also do work for fiber network owners. We do work for municipalities, um, utilities, uh, telcos, and even a little bit for wireless ISPs. Um, on the broadband consulting side, um, again, our, our principal focus is on the public sector side. So um, most of our clients are either uh, at the municipal level or at the state level. Um, and, but, but increasingly, we've been, we've been developing a book of work um, that is um, actually for investors, private, private investors who are looking to put money um, into broadband networks, most typically fiber networks. Um, and so we've been doing a variety of you know, due diligence kind of engagements um, uh, with, with those groups. Um, so again, I said we, we actually have, at this point, we've expanded to a nationwide presence in terms of our offices. Um, and um, we have um, uh, a CLEC affiliate as well, which doesn't actually do uh, what you typically think of as a competitive telephone company doing. It's really more of a vehicle for facilitating um, uh, network access for, uh, for, the, for the clients who are actually building and operating um, networks and stuff. Chris, tell people what a CLEC is. Yeah, so a CLEC is a competitive local exchange carrier. Um, the significance of that is that, um, uh, and, and the primary reason that we go after it is because um, in many states and many jurisdictions, your ability to access uh, polls or rights of way uh, can be tied um, to that regulatory classification. So it's something that we've gone after in essentially in 50 states, almost at 50 in terms of receiving it, um, the certification, um, because it, it gives us a tool uh, to help our clients you know, get access to those pieces of critical infrastructure when they need. 
so these are just a uh, this is a small sampling of the uh, of the clients that um, that we're doing. I'm focused here on the government and nonprofit clients. So, um, uh, like I said, a lot of uh, we have actually four state broadband agencies as as clients. We we have many more than 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 one um, uh, municipal client, but I. I call out Sanford, Maine in part because it's in northern New England and it's one of our clients who um, is the furthest advance where we've actually helped them all the way through kind of the you know initial planning, feasibility study, engineering, construction, negotiating with an ISP partner. You know, it's, it's one where we, you know, I can, uh, you know, I can sort of show you the full, um, you know, end-to-end -end, um, uh, life of that project. And the other one I put up here is an interesting one that we worked with recently is the Post Road Foundation. It's a, it's an, a foundation that came out of uh, Harvard. It's funded by the Rockefeller Center. And they've been doing work on um, how to accelerate um, investments in um, municipal and cooperatively owned um, broadband infrastructure. Um, so we've worked with them uh, to do essentially pre-feasibility studies um, on a couple of, of communities in um, in northern New England, um, the interesting th thing about that is it's you know it, it's at, it's an interesting uh, intersection um, between some of the municipal work that we've done, but also um, some of the the um, uh, work for uh, investors that they've, they've been focused on on talking to both communities, uh, both municipals, cooperatives, and private investors. <coughs> Um, I, uh, go through this just really quickly is sort of turning to some some examples on the on the network deployment side, you know on on fiber deployments um, really everything from uh, designing it, um, permitting it, surveying, um, uh, and and construction and construction project management uh, are things that we do. Um, we have a similar. Um, range of services on the on the wireless side, and on the wireless side, you are um, uh, clients um, range from um, uh, cellular, although that's mostly focused on, on getting on structures. But in terms of the network design and analysis, um, you know, uh, wireless ISPs, utilities, um, <clears throat> a, a range of, of those kinds of companies. Um, let's talk a little bit, though, about the work that we do for municipalities when we're in a consulting mode. Um, so I've got two slides on this. Um, so here are some of the things that, that are, are within our wheelhouse and you know, that we've, we've done with many, many um, municipal clients, many of them in New England, but um, at this point um, sort of spread around the country. Um, and it you know, ranges from early stage broadband assessments and plans. I think that's probably less interest to you because the typical client who does that um, is trying to figure out what they want to do about broadband. You sort of are, this organization is sort of born with its mission um, of what it's going to do. So really, I think more applicable to what we're talking about here are feasibility studies where um, you know, we do uh, you know, what I would call a mid-level design. Um, not a you know fully engineered constructible document, but but something that allows us to develop a cost estimate and allows us to develop um, a, uh, a financial analysis of it. We have a pretty detailed um, you know workbook that we use to work those up. Look at the business case. We can look at it under you know a variety of different um, operating model assumptions. Um, you know how do you work with a with a private you know partner or, or even do it yourself. Um, under a variety of situations, and, and also be able to to look, uh, you know, scenario, you know, what, how sensitive are we to to different take rates, to different, you know, revenue assumptions, different costs. Um, we can do that kind of scenario analysis. Um, oftentimes, um, clients of ours who who uh, sort of graduate beyond that stage and actually are um, looking to implement a network, uh, we find that um, the most common. Um, form a project as a public-private partnership, where the municipal entity is working with um, a, a, a private ISP or a network operator, um, and so oftentimes we work in the mode then of helping them select and structure uh, their agreements with their partners. Um, and, and our municipal clients usually find that, that having somebody with that industry knowledge helps them do better deals um, when it comes to doing their public-private partnership. 
Um, and then, you know, I, beyond that, um, we don't always, um, with our consulting clients, um, it's not necessarily a given that we go to design and construction. Um, probably the most common service that we do for our consulting projects is to do the engineering phase, the, you know, the detailed bill of materials, and, and help them select um, their construction vendor. Um, but you know, we, have, um, uh, we have been involved on an ongoing basis with the construction project management and the poll survey and helping you get access to polls and things like that. Let me pause there and just see if there are any questions about. I mean, this is these are our, the typical services that we do with our um, municipal clients, and I think are the ones that sort of the suite of services that um, is most applicable to the kinds of things that you'll be looking to do. So let me just stop and see if you have any questions on that so far. Yeah, just on the on wording there on the last one, poll survey and licensing. What do you mean by licensing? So, um, you know, a typical arrangement is that you would enter into a poll attachment agreement with a poll owner or, um, or poll utility. owners, uti uh, electric utility or telephone company who owns the polls. Um, and then once you have that sort of overarching agreement, um, you would prepare and submit individual poll licenses or batches of polls, if you will. So, you know, we have a whole department of people whose job it is to negotiate, you know, poll agreements and, and prepare poll licenses and manage the process of, of, of getting on polls. So that's, does that answer your question? Sure. Okay, great. Is, is the process the same in most states? I mean, I, I assume by the way you <coughs> operate around the country that it is very similar, but is there anything unique about what happens with broadband in Vermont that we should know about? Well, there's one thing that is fairly unique in Vermont um, that is unique in your favor, um, and I know about it because I helped to create it, <laughs> um, which is that um, in many states, um, access to polls are, and, and even to public rights of way are often limited to regulated entities. Um, in Vermont, uh, sort of atypical, that's been expanded uh, to include broadband providers and broadband infrastructure uh, providers who, who may or may not have a regulated business. Um, and so that's um, something that is a more favorable situation in Vermont than oftentimes you'll find in many states. And has that had an impact in Vermont in terms of build out of broadband? Um, or, is it, or is it waiting to be tapped as a... Michael, go ahead. Let me just say that the Grassbury Municipal Project did not apply for a certificate of public good. They asserted that they were a broadband provider to the Public Service Board at the time when I was at PUC. Were granted that. They had to demonstrate insurance and a couple of other things. And then they were granted that. And by dint of that, they had the right to all the polls, attached to polls, without being a CLEC or without getting a certificate of public good. So it, it absolutely is a Advantage. Yeah. Um, and and, be, and, and the, because that's often the case in most states, that's that's why Tilson did, went to the effort to become a CLEC in all these other states. Because oftentimes you need that, and, and not everybody has it. So, um, quick question: um, Would you be willing to share your slideshow? Sure. Okay. Um, the easy one. Um, the second, how does that, how does the relationship with private investors work that, is that, they, they, co they come in and, um, you know, they, they buy bonds somehow through you, or uh, promissory notes, or how does that usually structure, are there, are there rates that you know of? Yeah, so actually, um, um, uh, I'm going to go into that in a, in a little bit, sure, a little bit uh, later in the presentation. I will say that, um, what I'm going to present to you is not necessarily the way we typically work, right? So this isn't something that I would uh, I would say you know we've done this this deal half a dozen times. It's actually you know something that is a, um, a response to what we've observed in terms of the momentum and the trajectory of a lot of municipal projects, which is often quite slow. It oftentimes you know takes years and years many, 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 many iterations, and there's um, uh, some communities, frankly, just run out of steam, and they never get there. Um, so um, this is something that um, 
I think we've been able to observe, both from our work in municipal, um, with municipal clients, um, and our observations, some of the insights that we've been able to glean by doing um, projects for investor groups and organizations like Post Road, um, about an alternative way it might work. Um, and it's a way that may fit, I think, some of the particular constraints that you have um, here. Um, but we'll see. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, and you, you give me the feedback on whether you agree with it. Um, but first, let me just sort of, sort of say, you know, our typical way of working is fee for service, right? And and honestly, um, if if you wanted to hire us fee for service, we'd love to work that way. That would be our preferred way to do it. It's the way we usually work. Um, and you know, um, you know, we are basically we work as your expert. Um, in dealing with the other people who are in the industry, um, that um, is sort of the expert, you know, the expertise on your side, right? So we're, you know, in our, th we're not looking to be your ISP. Um, you know, we're um, we're willing to do as much of the work on network development as you think is advantageous to us. But if you want us to simply work in an advisory role, we're perfectly content to do that as well. Um, so, you know, basically, um, you know, we find that um, uh, it adds a momentum to a project um, if you have a company like Tilson working with you. Yes? Uh, maybe a quick question. Um, one of our uh, models is EC Fiber, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know if Tilson worked with EC Fiber. No. Well, no. But, no. but you may know who did and, and, and what kind of work they did for EC Fiber, and that's what I'm curious to know. Um, I think there are other people who also have knowledge, so if you do, feel free to, feel free. I mean, I think that, um, uh, so they worked from a very uh, early stage with uh, ValleyNet, uh, which was a nonprofit ISP. Um, and, and Matrix, yeah, Matrix, which is a which is an engineering construction company. Mm -hmm. um, some of the so in some ways they 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 picked their partners at the outset, right? They, um, uh, and honestly, I don't really know exactly what process that they they went through uh, to to uh, to pick those. I do know that um, uh, you know, some of the major personalities that, that went along with it. You know, Tim Nolte, who was involved with Burlington Telecom, um, you know, went to ValleyNet and was part of the group that, you know, pitched EC Fiber and developed that, that relationship. Um, uh, Ron Castle was the principal at Matrix, and I'm a little bit less clear about what the relationship was there. But they picked their, their partners from the outset. Um, I think that, um, you know, they raised a lot of their initial money through notes, um, you know, particular form of borrowing, and um, they had, they raised it from the community, they also raised it, a lot of it from some of the people who were on the, on the, um, the board of the organization or the board of ValleyNet, um, or um, uh, from, from Matrix, so, um, uh, although, you know, that's, that's as much as I'm, I'm aware of in terms of their, of their process. And let me just say one thing. And none of those organizations, except for Valinet, are still with DC Fiber. None of the people who, like Tim Nolte's not with them, Matrix is not with them, whoever did the initial construction is not with them. They're using a different engineering firm, a different construction contract from them. Yeah. Hmm. Who are they using that? Um, Fiber Smith and Eustace. Um, okay, so let's let's talk about. So I'm familiar um, with the Vermont Communications Union District legislation, um, <clears throat> and although it's relatively new, um, a lot of the um, elements of it you can see, you know, going back several iterations into into other municipal networks in Vermont. Um, here are some. These are my observations. Um, if you don't think these are true, feel free to speak up and, and, and let's, let me get your perspective on it. But 
Um, so here are some of the, the parameters. So net revenue is the principal source of funding and fine, uh, of, of and repaying financing for a Vermont communications district. You're not allowed explicitly to use tax money. So you know, unless you're getting you know grant money, um, or you're you know borrowing money, I mean the revenue is, is what you, you have to pay your bills. Um, and if you borrow money, unless you're getting grant money, the revenue is what you have to repay the borrowing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the I think one of the hurdles for a for a new district, um, as opposed to something like EC Fiber, where they they've sort of you know. They've launched. They've they're already they've already got a track record. Is you don't start with a track record of generating revenue. Um, so the question, just two questions, really. So how do you really first you know achieve enough scale so that you can actually efficiently operate? Right. Um, mm -hmm. I think EC Fiber probably operates a lot more efficiently now at the scale that they're at than when they first started. Mm -hmm. um, and you know how do you acquire the talent you need before um, before revenues? I mean, you're I'm sure you're a hard-working group of volunteers, but you're a group of volunteers, right? And and you really your your effort should be should be larger than the effort that can be under you know carried out by a group of volunteers. Um, you want to be providing the direction, and, and you really you know need folks to help help you ach uh, achieve your vision. So. Oftentimes, well, first let me stop there. I mean, is, is, does this seem accurate? I see a lot of nodding hands. Yes, yeah, of course. Yep. Okay, good. Um, so oftentimes I like to start with where are we trying to get to, right? And I, I think that this may not be everything, but I think that the, the place you're trying to get to is Central Vermont Internet has constructed a district-wide fiber network, which is operated by professional staff at efficient levels which generates sufficient net operating revenues to service any debt obligations. So the question is, how do you get there? And so the, 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 the uh, alternative I want to I, I explore is, what if you could essentially start there um, instead of having to get there? Um, so um, this is what I think you know, could be an alternative approach that could potentially work with the kinds of constraints that a municipal communications district of Vermont faces. Um, so it would work something like this. Um, Central Vermont contracts with a project developer. That developer is charged with delivering a functioning, fully developed network with paying customers and a team to run it. The project developer is responsible for finding investors to fund the construction and the initial startup and assembling the team to build it and to operate it. The project developer gets paid to do this as fees that are part of the initial capitalization and operation of the network. So in other words, you're, not, you're, in, you're indirectly paying the project developer, but you're not directly paying the project developer. Um, you mean, so they're taking the initial revenue or they're getting they're getting paid out of the initial capitalization okay. of the project. Assuming there is an initial capitalization. Assuming there is an initial capitalization, exactly. Um, so um, um, Central Vermont Internet agrees to purchase the resulting network at a pre-negotiated price and time once it's constructed and developed a track record of generating revenue. So the trick here is is finding the price that makes sense for the investors and the project developer financially, mm -hmm. and also is you know um, uh, is reasonable enough that you can borrow to raise the money to pay it, and then that the cost of servicing that borrowing can be paid out of the revenue stream that the network at that point already has. So, who is the owner that we purchase from? Is it? Is it the developer or is it the investors? Uh, it could be either one. Um, the way, I, uh, and I'm not really wedded to one or the other at this point, but the way I'm tending to think about it right now is the developer and the investors are two, are two entities. Right? It's, there's, there is an investor group whose purpose is... So they own it. Yes, they own the network. They own the network. They, but, but they get their early out but they have an exit strategy, right? right? Exit strategy. And their exit strategy is you, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, 
And so it's part of the agreement that they will be gone. They will be gone. Okay. They will be gone. Right. Um, and and you know this is this is this is um, the idea of building a network for the purposes of selling it is a thing, right? And there are investors who are not looking to own it for 20 years. They're you know they're looking to have a you know three to five year window and be out, mm -hmm. right? Um, so um, that's not a guarantee that the economics of, of this particular network fit their criteria, but as a category, it's a thing. Um, so the key is, for, for, for you, is that um, uh, it eliminates the challenge that you have um, at, the, at, the, uh, at the outset, which is that trying to borrow against a network that doesn't have a track record. Um, you, you essentially agree to buy the network once it has a track record and is meeting certain performance metrics. And the investor group is basically having whatever credibility the uh, Central Vermont Fiber has from its member towns uh, in order to negotiate uh, pool agreements, et cetera, that are, are necessary for them. Yeah, I mean, um, I think that the poll agreements, um, um, I don't think that you would need, um, this is a little bit of a weedy question, but um, and so I'm giving you a little bit of a weedy answer. Um, uh, I think that probably you wouldn't need Central Vermont Internet to be involved at all in the initial getting the poll attachment agreements. However, if it wasn't, you'd have to have a mechanism for transferring those you know, poll, poll licenses over. I can think of a number of different ways to do it, so I'm not going to say which one. What? Would it be branded though, you know, Central Vermont? I, I think you could. I think you could do that as part of this. Yeah. I mean, if the idea is just is to, you know, is to sell it at a, at a sort of a known uh, point in time, um, I think you could do this with um, with a Central Vermont Internet brand. And and you, would, I mean, you would. I would expect that Central Vermont Internet, you know, there would be a negotiated set of parameters so that you're you're comfortable with that brand, right? You're going to want to know things like pricing parameters and you know speed tier parameters and things like that. So I think it would you know need to be presented to the public as you know as a partnership, right? Um, that has these you know these parameters and these sets of responsibilities at different sets of time. When, when is the pre-negotiated price determined? I think you I think you have to negotiate at least a mechanism for doing that up front. So like, it's not the only way you could do it, but you know, as a for instance, you could do it as a, you know, a certain multiple over um, net income. Something that would be, um, I think, well understood by the investors would also be well understood by people you'd be trying to sell bonds to, actually, right? Um, yeah, that, that, that seems like that could be fraught with all sorts of risk for both the developer, the private contractor, as well as the communications union district. Well, I agree. I mean, I think that you there would need to be some work put into constraining the risk, uh -huh. right? I mean, like, you wouldn't want to write a blank check. You know, you don't, don't write a blank check on this, right? Like, I mean, you'd want to consider things like, um, you'd want to consider things like um, uh, having, un understanding that the, the network was constructed to a certain spec. You'd want to understand things like um, that the financial performance was a certain level. Um, I think you know you like for, for instance you would want to avoid a situation that obligates you to pay a high price, um, and um, uh, even if the the, rep, you know, the the initial period the, the network underperforms. You know, rep. Frankly, that wouldn't actually be in the interest of the investor group for that to happen either, because you need a business case that's bondable, right? For them to get their exit. Um, so, I mean, there is, it's not a perfect alignment of interest, but there's at least enough alignment on that where um, you, they want you to buy it. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to buy it at a, you know, a level that allows you to service the debt, right? So, um, one of the things that I, I think is, you know, draws me to multiples of net operating income is you can model that and you can also, you know, it, it to a certain extent can uh, float uh, with the performance. So, uh, you know, the, the investors can bring in a network that's performing a little bit better. You know, they can get a little bit more of a premium. If they underperform, they get less money on their exit. Um, 
So I think those are, I think you're, you're right to think about the potential downsides. Um, and, and those would certainly be something that you'd have to, you'd have to manage. Yes. Yeah. So ISP sales that I'm familiar with have typically been for assets. Mm -hmm. And this contemplates selling everything, including the debt. Right? Bonding. Mm -hmm. No. No? <clears throat> no, no. So um, I, the initial construction could be financed with, with debt or equity, but, but it's a private debt or equity. Whatever it is, it's, it's privately financed. The public debt is coming in and buying out that. Okay. Watch. Hmm? Gone. Right. That's the yeah. idea. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. All right. Is there an existing model for buying a network with bonded public public bonded debt? Um, so um, I think the uh, the more um, common um, uh, situation would be buying out one private group with another private group. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, fundamentally, as long as the financial performance is there, right, um, to repay the debt, I mean that's your principal barrier to being able to go out and, and bond. Right? Is the revenue you have to is demonstrating that the revenue is there. So um, you know, I think that um, the I, I think the potentially attractive thing again, assuming the numbers are, are, are there for the financial performance, is that you can, instead of being a, a private entity saying, well, I think, you know, in three to five years I can, I can go out and sell this in the market to another investor group, you know up front, right, yes, you know, I, I have a buyer, a buyer that's committed as long as, you know, these boxes are checked, right, mm -hmm. you know, who will pay this much for it. Or, you know, this much in, in the, you know, in, the, in a negotiated range, right? right? It depends on the metrics. That's really gone the other way around up in Burlington. The other way. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, and, you know, what, what, would there be any legal impediments provided that the bond could be issued? I think maybe that's a tighter question. I mean, if, if we can, you know, we can get a bond for something, but what else would be in the way? Yeah, I think answering those questions would be really important to you know for the for the other, for the other, you talked about risks on both sides, right? That's I think that would be a category um, where there would need to be some but we, but uh, we can't, diligence done on that. But we can't point to another ex existing example right. where oh, it's been done this way over in this community already. And here's I, how you do it. I'm not saying it hasn't been done. I'm, I don't have an, an, um, an answer okay. off the top of my head. I will say um, I, one of our clients who was working on both sides of this um, for another network, mm -hmm. um, we talked about um, the idea of, of a transaction in, um, in, in this direction. At the time, for that particular client, I suggest it would more likely go the other way, another you know, municipality developing it, selling the network. Right. Right. Uh, that particular client could issue general obligation bonds, right? So they didn't have the same hurdle right. um, to overcome, yeah. right? Um, which is part of the reason um, why I think you more, like you're, uh, uh, in Burlington they didn't do it intentionally, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, there are examples of networks that go on the other so they, they don't need the track record because they can they can point to their taxing ability. You don't have that taxing ability. Right. Yeah. So from an operational thing, very, you know, I like this, great. Um, but do you think the leverage is there financially? I'm just trying to think of it from, you know, cutting down to the base motivations is, you know, a private equity person, you know, where's their... Where's their upside for the risk? I mean, you, I guess you did say, you know, yeah, they've got a known buyer with some boxes, but there's kind of an underlying financial engineering assumption here that because we can issue public bonds, you know, like if they've already got a network and it has X network operating income and everything else and they've got 
they've already built it and they've got leverage on it, are they obligated to sell it or is their return more than if they weren't in this kind of an arrangement? Like what's the appeal? Oh, I think you could write a contract where it's a, there's an obligation to sell. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think, what are their, what are their opportunities? So their, yeah, opportunity, yeah. Their, their opportunities to make money are, are like, I think, three principal ones. One is um, by close management of the project, they um, bring the capital cost. They develop the, you know, the specified network for a lower cost. Um, so yeah, and they get to sell it. You know, the, I don't think you would, I mean, you could do a cost plus arrangement for, um, uh, for the purchase price as opposed to like a, a multiple of, of, of net revenue. Mm -hmm. I think that it introduces some risk for you and um, reduces some risk for the, for the, for the, for the, um, for the investor potentially, um, but I'm not sure it's a good trade. So let's, let's just say for the moment that the, the purchase price is pegged to financial performance, not the cost to, to construct the network, right? So the first opportunity is manage the network cost, the construction cost well, pay less for the in, uh, asset, sell it for you know the same price. Um, second opportunity is um, uh, the operating, uh, net operating income of the network while it's while they own it. So better you can do um, the more in money. The shorter, you, right. If in, they can get it up fast and have a period of time where they can drag some of that into themselves. Right. Well. Which is aligned with your interest. That's what you yeah. want. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and the third opportunity is is if the purchase price floats based upon the financial performance, bring it at a higher financial performance, get a bigger payout at the end. Um, obviously, you know, that has to be constrained, right? You don't there's not an unlimited amount you'd be willing to pay, but I think it's probably a fair statement that you'd, you'd be able to afford to pay more for you know, a network that's performing well than a network that's performing less well. Yeah. Question, I guess, uh, that when you get into operations, uh, something like that, is yes, you can get, uh, you or whoever's putting the uh, deal together can get a number of hired guns who know how to uh, put this stuff together. Problem is when you've got it up and operating, then the uh, they move on, and the institutional memory of how it was put together, uh, where the uh, the kludges were, uh, etc., um, goes with them, and uh, so there's all sorts of little uh, potential hidden bugs in the system that uh, you know it makes a problem because. These are not widgets. I mean, I, you right. know, I, I, you know we, we, we all know that. So there, there is a question about you know what the operating intelligence that goes along with it, not just the, the thing. Well, you, you, that's a great question, and you've anticipated my next slide. So here's, here's, here's my approach to, to um, how I think that would work. So I've got like this is color coded to, to three different types of entities. So we've got um, uh, Tilson. We've got other entities that are Tilson selected. And then there's Central Vermont Internet and or affiliated entities that CV Internet selects. Um, so, and this is through four different phases: you know, the project formation, the development of the network, the ramp up, and then the long-term operations. And so, you know, Central Vermont Internet's got an over, you know, an ongoing role um, throughout the whole, all the phases, and an oversight role. Um, there, I think, would be a role for Tilson in the uh, overall system management that would continue at least through the ramp up period and then um, could be extended at Central Vermont Internet's option beyond that into the long term operations. Right? So, we're, as a, this is one of the reasons I'm sort of thinking of, um, of the investor and the project developer as, as, as two roles is that I think that there are elements of the team that the project developer is putting together that, again, at your option, you may want to have continue once the ownership changes, right? So that, at, you know, in, in, in kind of the, you know, the most fully fleshed out version of this, when, the, when there's this transition, nothing changes except who has the title to the, to the underlying network. The operations can continue exactly the same with the caveat in that your 
you know, your management role, you know, then be, as a board becomes magnified. You can, you can, you can, you know, you can fire the, the you know, the, the manager, you can hire a new one, you can, you know, you can make changes if you want to, but if you're happy, you don't have to, right? You can just keep that, um, that team in place. Um, so, you know, other things that I would, you know, see as being um, within Tilson's uh, role in such a project would be doing the initial, you know, feasibility financial analysis. So I've done enough analysis on this to know that it is neither a slam dunk uh, nor an impossibility, right? But um, um, we need to, we would need to get, you know, a better um, sense of the, of the financial um, feasibility of this. Uh, I would see, you know, Tilson being involved in the investor recruitment, doing the engineering, do the construction project management. We would probably, uh, we would want to, you know, select um, the, um, the investor group. We would probably hire um, a firm to do fiber construction. We would probably hire the firm, a firm to do the maintenance. We would probably, we're not an ISP, we'd probably hire an ISP um, or similar entity to be the network operator and essentially run it in a white label um, uh, 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 sense with CV Internet being, you know, being the brand. I, like similar to the, how this management is, is... Just like Trader Joe's. Yeah. Um, similar to how this is, um, you know, sort of system management's at your discretion after you take over the ownership. Maintenance, network operation, those can continue or you can change them. Once, you're, once you own the network, it's your choice, right? Uh, but it doesn't have to be a flash cut and everybody goes away and, and you're left with no institutional knowledge. Yeah. Me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the oversight part in the initial thing, how much of a role do we have in that? How much leeway do we have in saying, for example, you're only going to hire people that pay a living wage in the area these people are working. Um, that you're going to try to hire local talent if you can. And, and our, our obligation to our communities, are we going to be able to say something like that? Are the investor, investors going to say, oh, wait a minute, that's going to cost way more. I mean, I think that, I think it's I think it is a negotiation. I, don't, I mean, I think it's, um, I, I, I mean, nothing that you've said um, do I think is beyond the realm of possibility, but it depends on the whole picture, right? And, I, and we, we're like beyond, be, you know, before project formation here, right? Like there's other parties who need to say, who need to say yes that I'm not yet in a position to represent, right? So I think the short answer is it's a negotiation. And I think um, you probably wouldn't get everything you're looking for, but you, you know, probably in a position to ask for some things, right? And, and you know, once you become the network owner, you're in total control. You can, you can make all the decisions that you want. This is really about how do you, you know, build yourself a bridge to the point where you could bond and pay for the network. Siobhan, would you start putting together a list of those um, kind of important features that you would think yep. would be good, good to bring to the table? Should this go forward? Yes, thank, thank you. you. Uh, of course, there's still the feasibility and so forth to figure out if you have a general sense of the time frames of each phase, just in broad growth term. <coughs> um. <coughs> I, I think that um, an aggressive schedule for project formation <coughs> would be anywhere from six months to a year. I, and I, again, these are soft estimates, right? Um, um, Development, um, <coughs> it's got a pretty broad geographic area. Generally speaking, if you're going to do this, you're going to want to do it. Everybody's going to be aligned to go as fast as you can. 
So um, I would certainly shoot for two years or less. Um, you know, the system ramp up, I think, um, which might have some overlap with the development period, depending on how the deal is structured. Um, I think a typical horizon would be um, a three to five year window. Um, but that's going to depend a little bit on, on the investors themselves. Generally, you know, if we were using times net income as, a, as, a, as an example, the earlier you want to take over it, probably the more, you know, the systems has less time to mature, probably the more multiples you need to pay um, of it. On, and on the flip side, you know, it's going to be a rare investor who's going to want to be there for 10 years. If we're looking at this, you probably don't want them there for 10 years um, either. You probably want to take it over as soon as you, you know, it's feasible to do so. Um, and long-term operation is as long as you want to operate. So could you see possibility of going through formation, development, and ramp up sale three to five years to satisfy the investor's needs, but not build out 100% of 15 towns, but continue building afterwards with our own revenue? Yes. I think, I think one thing that you might, that um, should be um, an, an option on the table would be, I mean, I think you're going to need to hit certain, you know, financial return targets. Um, <clears throat> In some ways, if you can hit them on the, on the whole network, that's better. Um, if you can't, you know, looking at what you can do might be an option. Um, on the other hand, you know, if uh, you want to get to something that has a um, economies of scale, so you don't want to make it too small either. For sure. But well, I'll give you an example from Carol Monroe, who's now the CEO of ValleyNet. Um, said that EC Fiber is now at a mature level where it can really build a lot fast, mm -hmm. but the contractors are not. <laughs> that she can't get as many miles built in a year as she could fund. Yep. And we're going to be competing with her and all the other development in New England for contractor time. Um, and, and I'm imagining that you're being too optimistic about that development phase because of constrictions like that, plus our population densities mean we have to put a lot of miles up. You know, it affects the revenue per, per mile. So I just think that if we had a more modest goal, but still to sell early, to get to revenue neutral so we could sell. Yeah. Well, you could do and that, but keep building just like these fibers continuing to build now. Uh, on the other hand, that's part of what you're paying the project developer to do, is sure. to bring those resources. Sure. Now, I mean, I, that may go to. <coughs> I mean, I think if you are going to you know, have a surge of constructing your network, and you're only going to do it with the most local of resources, that's going to be a slow process, right? And it, and, it may, and and you know. Mm -hmm might be a lot longer than you would, would want it to take. I mean, it's not uncommon if you're going to build a large project to build in, you know, to bring in outside resources. Mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, how you surge beyond the like, local capability um, in order to get something done in a reasonable amount of time. So I hear your, your concern. Um, I don't think it's crazy. Um, um, I also think that um, it, it um, uh, it may be possible to mitigate that, and um, it's going to be easier to mitigate that with um, an entity that has a scale and a scope that's bigger than EC Fiber. So I'm, I'm looking on the Tilson website, and the very top it says, at Tilson we engage with organizations poised for not just evolution but revolution. Mm -hmm. Would you consider this approach you've been describing Revolutionary, or did you have something else in mind? For <laughs> <laughs> well, you, <laughs> if you know me, you'll know I'm not inclined to hyperbole. So, 
I have a hard time you know, describing something I'm presenting as revolutionary. Um, uh, I mean, I think that um, what I would characterize this is, is that it is, um, it's the application of um, a lot of um, hard-earned insight into how these projects tick, where sometimes they don't tick, and maybe what are some of the ways around some obstacles. That's a lot. I know that's a lot more tentative than revolutionary, but that's just that's my person. I'm not I'm not in charge of marketing for the company, so that's my personality. It's a website. It is fairly novel. I haven't seen a proposal like this before. It it's sort of like it's a meld of what happens in the corporate world, where one company develops something with their own resources in order to sell it to another one. Mm -hmm. You're talking about sell reselling it to a municipality that has no, no revenue. That's what's really unusual. Like yeah. How do you sell something to somebody with no money? <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, I think I'm going to be a little bit off topic from what they've been talking, so I'll just give people a chance to reflect on what you've said on that. But I, I the Vermont Telecommunications Plan refers uh, couple places they are trying to avoid redundancy in the systems in the state mm -hmm. as, as the development goes out for these things. And I'm going to just mention some things. I'm really not interested in the specific companies or the yeah. specifics. I'm more interested in the concept. But so some places that we have is a, a fiber cable that's been run through town. In Williamstown we have one that runs right up Route 14, doesn't have any off -ramp doesn't yeah. go anywhere, just runs through town. So um, that's one place where, of course, I'm sure the state wouldn't want us duplicating a fiber on that. And the other thing is that throughout town, um, then Fairpoint, now Consolidated, the alleged telecom company, <laughs> uh, strung out a lot of fiber, not to the homes, but from pole to pole. Yeah. Uh, throughout town. So is, is there anything that you're aware of or do you folks have any experience on working with these other entities either to, and especially <coughs> private entities, to get onto their systems or to actually buy out their hardware? Unless it's an entity whose business is, is um, leasing dark fiber and who's engineered their fiber to be useful for a fiber to the premise network it is not worth your time. It is one of the most, with my municipal clients, this is one of the most common blind alleys that I steer, need to steer people away from. Um, most of the fiber that you're going to see in your communities for the purposes of your project is either not appropriate to what you want to do, not available to you on reasonable commercial terms, or both. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah. It was EC Fiber made it put it up in the first place. That was their response to EC Fiber. They came through and said, "Oh, look, we're putting up all this fiber optic." I mean, so, the the counter example is is the counter example is what the VTA did with EC Fiber, where that fiber was designed from the get-go to be available on a dark fiber basis, engineered with um, access points at frequently enough so that it was usable by EC fiber as both to serve homes and businesses along the route and as a jumping off point for lateral extensions to serve the rest of the community. But that kind of fiber network is very uncommon. At least, well, it's uncommon everywhere, including Vermont. How, how that, when I first started coming to these meetings, we were talking about the 302 fiber thing that the state had done. There was some fiber that the state yeah, has that's placed. What yeah. That's what he's talking yeah, about? Yeah. Okay. All right. <clears throat> um, there's a couple of, I, some of these I've referred to, but. Um, um, this is where I had to pour a few drops of cold water on things. Um, so, you know, some important caveats. So, you know, like I said, um, 
we don't know, I mean, I, I, I repeat what I said before, I've done enough analysis to know that it's neither a slam dunk nor an impossibility, right? So there need, would need to be, you know, some additional work to, to narrow that pretty broad range um, to see if we actually have a project that would work for investors and work for you. Um, and the other thing that's important is, is that, you know, this is, this is a, what I just described as the alternative. Let me go back to the original. If you want to hire us on a fee-for-service basis, we're happy to do that, right? That's, that's what, how we typically work. Um, but doing the homework to know if the feasibility is there and the homework of selling it to the investors, that's a lot of at-risk, you know, investment of time. Um, more, t more typically than we, we do on a, on a project. And so um, we, you know, we'd need to factor in the upside for us on that part as well. And we'd also need some re reasonable assurances that if we were to start down a road and we got to a positive outcome, we got to a, to a deal, that you could, you could do a deal with us, right? And so thinking through um, what your procurement process is, um, you know, how could you engage, if you want, if you, after this, you still want, we're interested in engaging us, right? Um, but if you wanted to engage us, um, thinking through what that would look like, because we, you know, um, <coughs> we need to, to have a reasonably clear path that if we put in the work to do the, to do the analysis and we come out the other side and it, you know, it's thumbs up and we bring you a deal, the deal gets done, right? Obviously, you can't pre-commit without knowing, all of the details, right? You, but, but still, what we what we wouldn't want to hear is that we you know we put in six months of work to this, and then it goes out to bid, right? We we kind of need to understand what our what our path is. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the feasibility study could be done <clears throat> as fee for service, mm -hmm. leaving us free to choose which of our terms would be preferred. Yep. And we're happy to work that way. That's the way we typically work. Not opposed at all to working that way. Are you free to say, give some general idea of what a, the fee would be for? Um, I mean, it's going to depend on the um, on the scope of work. Let me say, as a here's my recommendation. Um, I mean. If you go down the, the fee for service uh, mode, I mean, generally, if you want to avoid getting stuck, oftentimes you could, you'd want to set aside. I mean, if you were to set aside the path all the way to engineering, right? And what that does is is give you um, something that you could put out to bid to a construction vendor. You have a uh, you have a um, firm construction price. Um, and then you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, a, you know, a basic feasibility study based upon a um, mid-level design, um, it would probably be, um, you know, upper tens of thousands. Again, it would depend, it would depend on the particulars, so you're right? Upper I, tens, you're saying like 70, 80,000, 90,000, or? It depends on the particulars. Right. One of the but things that's I'm, what you mean by over. Yeah, I mean, so the thing, the, the un, I'll be a little, try to be a little bit more transparent. The uncertainty factor that I'm struggling with here is that um, uh, it is. This is a good thing for you for your economies of scale, but it. it um, I need to, to do the, the I need to do the homework on it a little bit. Is that um, you know, twelve town region is a, lot, a little bit larger than oftentimes uh, than many of our clients. Not all of them. Um, I mean, I'm working with a, um, we're working with a city-county combination currently that is um, uh, larger um, than you um, geographically, um, and they've got an extensive scope of what they wanted to do um, that was very prescriptive, you know, and they're a couple hundred thousand dollars. So, so just to, just for clarity's sake, we're actually at 16 right. and nearly 17. So this map is it should be updated. Oh, great! Sorry, um, no, no, it's, it's, it's all good. We move fast. Um, but um, like Michael alluded to before, it's extremely likely and probably preferable, notwithstanding the economies of scale. But it's, we will probably start smaller. 
Mm -hmm. So a feasibility study that we're looking at, we might say, you know, what about those, if we just look here, just like those top six, so Worcester, Callis, Marshfield, Middlesex, East Montpelier, Plainfield, what if we just focused just on those? Or we said, do a feasibility study of the whole district to do a smaller project, and that's not the whole district. Right. So, I mean, the, the um, developing the mid-level design is somewhat scale, more scale dependent. Mm -hmm. Doing the financial analysis somewhat less, unless you decide to do lots of different scenarios, right? I want to do like the six towns and then these 12 towns, and then, you know, mm -hmm. and then it starts to get a little bit more, a little bit more work, although not, you know, not exactly straight line. Sure. Um, so <coughs> it would depend on the, on the, on the scope. How, how many, um, how many people are in Sanford, Maine? How many people are in Sanford, Maine? Sanford, Maine is about 25,000 people. Okay. Do you, do you recall offhand? Um, did they, did they contract with you to do a feasibility study? They did. Do you remember the cost of that? I mean, I can look it up. That too. was actually before my time in Tilson, and I can tell you if you, you call them and ask them for the same price, we would not do it for the same price. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm quite, quite sure you wouldn't, but just again, just to look at orders of magnitude yeah. for, for a municipal entity, you know, which was almost certainly several years ago, and you have right. to factor in all of the rest of the, of the cost, but at least you know, 25,000 people is, wouldn't, is not super different from a, a large chunk of right. our district, so. I think looking at well, looking at that just so that we can see what did their feasibility study look like, what did their RFP process look like, um, as we're sort of groping our way in the darkness here, um, knowing what your work products look like, yep. which is I think a big part of of our decision making process. So too. the other thing I would say to you too, I mean, first of all, you're, please call Steve Buck. He's he's a big he's a big he's a town manager. He's a big fan. Um, um, I will say that. Um, all of the things that we've done for Sanford, we've made advancements on since Sanford. So I would, you know, like the, the mid-level design process is better. Uh, the engineering process is better um, than when we did Sanford. The um, financial model is more robust um, than when we did Sanford. Although the financial model is similar, but it's, it's more robust. So all of those things have gotten, have, uh, uh, this, none of this is intended to, to, to discourage you from talking to Steve Buck, because I would love you to talk to Steve, uh, to, uh, to Steve Buck. Um, um, he gives a good reference. Um, but, uh, but I want to let you know that um, uh, the work products would not necessarily look exactly the same. They would be better. So you're saying things change in technology? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the population appears to be about 21,000, and the area of Sanford is about uh, 50 square miles. Yeah. So it's much dense, densely populated. Yeah, I mean, it, um, uh, Sanford, I, I mean, it's not exactly the same, but, you know, Sanford ha is, um, reminds me in certain ways of Barry. Is there, is there something unique to our district that you see? I mean, like, for example, the fact that Montpelier is right in the middle of it, <laughs> and it's the home of state government, is that an opportunity for us that's really important for us to keep our eye on, or is it something we should ignore because it's already tr attracted the big guys who want to provide service to state government? Um, so I would say probably more the, the latter. I mean, downtown Montpelier has so many fiber networks, and, you know, having at one point been having a role in procurement. I mean, the state's really looking at procuring over a, a wide area, so it's likely that um, a, um, a network that is a central Vermont network might be less attractive than a network that's a more of a statewide network. Um, and there are already a number of statewide networks that, that are in Montpelier. Um, that said, um, if I were, especially if I were working with a um, a private investor group, I'd probably at least explore um, developing a relationship with um, owners of other fiber networks who sell to different classes of customers than you would probably be most successful at selling to. I mean, I think, you know, you're probably, your bread and butter is probably going to be 
mass market customers, you know, residences and small businesses. Um, it's not impossible that you'll sell to um, uh, more enterprise customers and things like wireless backhaul, but it's going to be harder for you to do that as a, as a newer, smaller company. So I think it's <coughs> at least worth considering forming, seeing if you can form relationships with other companies who specialize in selling to those markets, but may not have facilities with the extent of the network that you're proposing to build locally. But that probably, but they probably already have network in, in on State Street. I just do want to point out while everybody keeps focusing on the northern tier of towns that you know <laughs> come up through Roxbury into Northfield and Williamstown isn't a bad idea either. <laughs> <laughs> and, and orange off the side. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we got orange exists. <laughs> Given your growth, Tilson's growth, and then the the nature of this thing's seemingly going exponentially and even in Vermont. I mean, the economic development potential for even developing fiber companies <coughs> to, in terms of construction and maintenance and whatever it seems to be there. Is the state I even talk to you, economic development-wise? Uh, states um, not Training. approach Tilson on that <laughs> subject, on that subject. Right. We, I, I mean, the, Tilson sells to state governments and yeah. looks at business opportunities. So I won't tell you that Tilson's not had any conversation with Vermont state government, but I think on the particular thing that you're asking about, no. Seems like it's an opportunity for some entrepreneurs. <coughs> so the one, not to, given this model to me from a risk perspective, it seems like we should build it all because yeah. we want the builders to take the risks. We want the private investors to do it. And we're not, you know, for us to make a choice about, oh, we build out populated versus less populated or not, and not knowing what the model really works, like I would, it would be my perception that you'd want to push that all onto that. I mean, I mean they're building it on spec to sell us back and it's got to perform. So like, we develop the criteria and say do it. Yeah, gen generally speaking, as long as, as long as the inclusion of additional areas don't, you know, break, break, right. break the economics of it, um, I would say generally it's going to be more attractive, more investable as a larger project. Sure. Because even if you did all of this, it's still not that big a project. Right. Um, in in the for the you know category of, of people I have in mind about you know, who you talk to. Okay. So if it was too small a project, it might actually lose interest. Kind of the model that we use to build our house. We got a builder, he took the risk on the loan, and then we bought the house from him complete, but he built it to our specification. <laughs> it's it's how municipal solar projects are financed, too. Mm -hmm. So, two points. Um, one, I think when we compare to Sanford, Maine, or wherever, we pro rather than on the basis of population, we should probably, or maybe we, we have to take that into account, but we should. Also compare on the basis of road miles because of the scale. Um, this is a lot more road miles. Yeah, a lot, a whole lot. Yeah. 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 So that, that's one point. And the other one is um, I was thinking about my question before about the fee for service for the feasibility study, followed by perhaps electing to <coughs> do your alternative plan. Uh huh. Um, we could come up with a rent to buy kind of arrangement too, where we pay fee for service, but if we decide to stick with Tilson and go with this investment thing, then some of that investment that we've made in the feasibility study could be rolled into the purchase price or something like that. Yeah, I think we could explore that. I haven't thought through it entirely, but conceptually, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say no. <laughs> that, 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 would, that would be good for both parties because you're not doing the feasibility on pure spec. You're right. getting paid for it. On the other hand, we're not throwing it away if you were going to put it in anyhow to do the big thing. Right. So it kind of shares the risk. Right. Where are we as a municipality on having to put this sort of stuff up to the emergency policy? Yeah. It's your own policy. There's no there's, there's no, no legal requirement. No. Put, school oh. school districts have a have a requirement, but not municipal. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. So that doesn't extend outside. <coughs> okay. But we will. We will. I mean, we will have so purchases over five thousand dollars or two thousand dollars or whatever we decide. It's really the right thing to do. It's like the conflict of interest policy we adopted quickly. It's not mandatory, 
but it's a really darn good idea. Right. When we start to sell bonds or promissory notes, are they tax-free instruments for the buyers? Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not a tax attorney. I, I think I, I have an opinion, but it might not be the right one. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them are, potentially could be, but we may not qualify depending on the nature of the business that we are undertaking. So, so I can, not I, all, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I can, I, having talked to the chief financial officer of EC Fiber or ValleyNet, um, he said that the what the the bonds that they issued are indeed, and the promissory notes that they did issue were indeed um, tax-exempt, yeah, tax tax right? Yep. So, wow. so, so that you know, the percentage, and this is something that was echoed when I talked to the um, Central Vermont Economic Development folks, um, that you know, if we offered a you know X percent rate on that, because it's tax-exempt, we actually bumped that up three or four percent effectively. Right. So that's that's a benefit to us right. um, in you know nice being able to right. offer that. I think that's a that's a Paul Giuliani question about how you yes. package that. Um, but generally just the fact that we are a municipality does not mean that the bonds we issue for this specific project are tax exempt. Hmm. They have to meet certain qualifiers from the IRS. So that, so, so municipalities can issue non-tax exempt bonds as well, mm -hmm. and they have to depending on how the deal is structured. Mm -hmm. If too much of the public benefit is put is is derived by <coughs> private parties, they will no longer qualify as for tax exempt status. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if a municipality builds a stadium with public money and finances it with tax exempt bonds, but then turns around and through a management agreement turns over the operation to a private entity and they derive too much benefit from that, you lose your tax exempt status. So it depends on how the how the how the structure how the financing is structured in a range. Hmm. Just one <coughs> point of clarification. Um, it, it looks like you work for uh, in part for uh, public entities, mm -hmm. municipalities. Uh, in in the scenario of uh, private investors basically putting up money and taking the responsibility for you know creating a network that then we might buy from them. In that scenario, would Tilson? Uh, I, 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 it seems to me that the, it's very very tricky to negotiate the agreement between it would be between us and the the private investors. Right. Uh, <clears throat> very tricky um, and the private investors in a way would have an advantage because they've done that before we haven't uh, would Tilson represent us or I, the private investors I think I think um, I, so I think we could probably structure it uh, I think we could probably consider structuring in a number of different ways but my my mental model for this under you know a pure version of this yeah. right is that um, we have a contract with you, um, and we take at least through the system ramp up, right? All of the other relationships are with us. So, in other words, you know, we're we're at, everybody else is you know behind us. You're over here. We you've got one contract, um, one contract to manage um, with us. I, I, again, I'm not saying that's an absolute requirement, but that's that's sort of my my, my current mental model yeah. for this. So like, like the buyer realtor. I mean, I, I think it's it's possible just to sort of, you know, break that out, right? So um, I, I think at least while somebody else has, you know, is financing and, and, and owns the network, I mean, they're going to need to have some contractual relationship with the people who are operating it, right? Because their performance right. depends on that. I, I think it's, I, again, we haven't, it's not already done, but I think it's not outside the realm of possibility that, you know, some of these other things that you're going to need, um, you could have pre-negotiated terms for, 
you can take them over, right? Um, and then you, can, then you can have a direct relationship. As a matter of fact, you know, in terms of when you enter the long-term operation period, um, that would be more typical of how we might work with a client who is in that phase, and we'd be um, very comfortable at that phase doing it. Like, in other words, once, once you were to take it over, maybe then, you know, you'd have the direct relationship um, with the maintenance and, and the network operations and the manager, right? And the manager would not have the relationship with this. The manager would work for you right. to oversee these, just in the way that before that ownership takes over, the manager would work with these to make sure that, you know, they, they do what the, you know, the, the owner at that point um, needs. Okay. Maybe one final question for Chris, if you have any, and then we'll let him wrap things up. Um, I assume you've vetted this with Tilson Management, and yeah, I've had they like I, this idea. I, 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 <laughs> you and I had a prior conversation where I was a little bit worried about that. Um, uh, there was an unanticipated, un, uh, the magnitude of the enthusiasm was greater than I had anticipated. Now, again, subject to, right, <laughs> right, 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 like it's got, like the numbers have to work, right, um, but conceptually, you know, when I talked about this as a conceptually way to a, a way to work, yes, there was. Um, uh, we're we're kind of at a phase where um, we uh, uh, are interested in exploring how we can take on a bigger role um, in some of these projects, and you know, putting you know putting the project together is a way of mm -hmm. um, of taking on a, a, a bigger role in these projects. Good sense. Last word, Dad. On your first part there, um, how is your determination that this is viable uh, and sufficiently attractive done? Are we, are we at risk on that, or are you? Uh... Well, so again, you know, one, one approach is the one that you know Mike, Michael's uh, uh, talked about, right? Where um, you know you you pay us for the result and. and you pay and you pay us for the result, whatever the result is, right? In terms of the financial analysis, of course, you want it to be good, but you want to know the, the answer one way or the other. Um, and um, I, I would imagine, in the alternative, um, ideally, we sort of um, structure this with a series of, of um, pre-understood off ramps, right? Because you don't want to be tied up with an engagement with us if it's not going to work out, and we don't want to be tied up doing analysis if it's not going to work out. So I, I sort of see this in, mm -hmm. in proceeding down like a, a series of, of analysis at, at a you know, uh, more granular level of detail. I mean, at a, at a high level, I mean, I can do a capital cost estimate based upon four cost factors, right? Um, mm -hmm. I can you know, break that down all the way to you know, more than 100. <laughs> Um, so, um, and, and going down that level, I need more and more granular information, and I have to put in more time uh, uh, to do that. Um, so, um, I think, you know, if we weren't being paid to do the feasibility study, which again, we'd be happy to work fee for service, um, I, I would anticipate saying, okay, you're going to have this much time, you, you know, you're going to get to this, you know, to this level of analysis. If the result is still green, you know, then we go to the next one. Uh, if it isn't, you know, we disengage and, you know, we don't do any more work and you're free to, to work with whoever you want to work with. Okay. Thanks for that, Chris. If anybody has uh, other questions or thoughts about this, we'll have this on the agenda next month, too. So we'll come back around and continue talking about this. Um, thanks very much for coming. Very yep. much appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, next thing, um, Phil, uh, WEC report back? Okay, yeah, just very quickly. Um, I had a couple of conversations with folks at uh, Wash Electric Co-op who manage their community fund. Um, yeah, I'm just looking for a small grant of uh, any kind to help us with uh, startup costs. I mean, they, maybe I can get them to fund the feasibility. <laughs> um, the initial response I got from them was that they didn't fund projects like that. Um, and they, they didn't really see the community need aspect of it. Um, they since have given me an opportunity 
to actually make a case. So that's where we stand. I'm going to. They don't have any formal application process. It's really basically me writing a position paper, if you will, about why we need some money and why this whole project serves the community at large, especially their customers. So that's where we stand. So I'm going to put a couple of pages together and send it off, and it may result in some money and like that. <laughs> okay. Business Development Committee report back, and folks who uh, have Jerry's email in, in front of them uh, would be um, probably do this better. Um, I don't have it in front of me. I left my computer at work today. Um, there is some work being done on, on the survey. I think we're getting towards a final product. You can certainly correct me if I'm wrong, um, David. I think we lost we lost Michael, but I know he was part of that uh, part of that process as well. The members of the committee have about a week to finish their edits. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, yeah, and Jerry Diamantidis um, sends his his regards, but he's I think his his kids are in town this week, and he's not he's not able to uh, not able to attend. Um, does anybody have? Do you have Jerry's email up? If yeah. you want to take that, David. Uh, besides the survey, we are. Um, Compiled a list of like 25 potential grant and funding sources that we're trying to sort out what the due dates and their applications are and what the likelihood and what the sources are. We, at our meeting last week, we learned that there is some effort on the part of the state to maybe have a fund, a revolving loan fund program that we might be able to take advantage of, um, be going through the legislature. And uh, one of the things that <coughs> We really feel important that every member here talk to their representatives and senators about the need to support whatever efforts might come by the way of the legislature or so just to also just educate them on what we're doing. It's really important. Um, and I have a list of all those if you don't have them. Um, and then the uh, the other thing, business development committee tasks and support of grant writing. Well we may a grant writing planning consultant. So we talked about that. We haven't made that decision yet. We're also trying to get a website up, I believe. I don't see Elliot here. It's um, it's, 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 up. It, it's up. I, I, I have had been privileges now. It's cbfiber.net. It's been up for about two months. Okay. Um, there there have been some, um, he just actually created a couple of email addresses for it as well. And I, I got rights to <coughs> post materials. And I think um, we'll probably try to get Rebecca access to do that too, but I need to put up minutes and agendas and that sort of thing mm -hmm. to keep with, with what we were talking about and with sort of um, kind of a, a constant um, constant series of requests from from various people for that material. And I believe that's all we had from our meeting. Do you have anything else? I was just saying, did you want to talk about Ken? This, uh, there, there is an interest in the Department of Economic Development in the uh, state and what we're doing. Uh, you know, yeah. they. There is a strong belief that this uh, is an economic development issue, and that should be also mentioned if you're talking to your legislators, uh, because um, the ability to work at home, the ability to attract new business, the ability for businesses to be able to uh, operate is a crucial issue because economic development seems to be on the mind of every legislator right now. So to the extent that this could be supported through that rubric uh, would be um, highly beneficial. Yeah, I mean, if, ask any economist and they're going to say that there's a direct causal link between broadband infrastructure development and economic development. So, it's House just, values. Yeah. yeah, House values too. Can't forget that one. Uh, well, the, listen, I, just to throw in on that before we move on, I was talking to my daughter the other day. She was uh, 25, I think, maybe 26, I don't know, something like that. But I was asking her about that, and she said when she looks at a place to live, the first thing she looks at is a broadband. She doesn't care about the cable TV access or anything. You know, all she's interested in is, is the pipeline coming in, and the only reason she gets the TV is because um, I which car, uh, cable companies up there, they make them take it as a package, and they, otherwise they charge them exorbitant fees for just internet access. So, so you draw back to Williamstown. <laughs> Go down to DSL. <laughs> yeah, well, a couple of years anyway. Maybe maybe by the time she's thirty. 
Okay. Um, reports from various meetings. That's that's me. Um, I also want to talk about a couple upcoming meetings. Um, I have a meeting with the Woodbury Select Board. I think it's on Monday. Um, one of the Woodbury Select Board members is a um, representative on Central Vermont Regional Planning. Invited me to come to their Select Board meeting next week. Um, I think our next agenda is going to have a request from them to join. So. Um, I don't think anybody's going to run screaming from the room. We haven't done anything, uh, any sort of like super heavy financial lifting, but we'll, we'll certainly sort of finish up the rest of Washington County up on that side and sort of logically connect then Worcester and Cabot. Um, so if anybody has any, any bits and pieces that they want to um, pass along to them or somebody would like to, to join me, maybe not too many people, um, happy to have you come along. And the closest to the hardwood fiber. <laughs> there you go. Um, we have a meeting uh, upcoming with a Washington Electric Co-op's board. Um, refresh my memory. What day is that, Michael? 24th. Okay. So that's coming up. Uh, I had a meeting with the technology coordinator. Uh, Siobhan and I had a meeting with the technology coordinator for Washington Central Supervisory Union. Um, the superintendent of that of, that, of the U32 district and all of the elementary schools in that district um, had previously indicated to me that he was interested in what we were doing. Three of the elementary schools in that district do not have fiber, um, and Siobhan has been looking at um, the E-rate program, which is how the schools get um, subsidized funding for technology and internet access. Um, the technology coordinator, and I think, I don't think I'm probably misstating this when I'm saying that he was excited and certainly motivated to help um, help us do um, what we can in conjunction with the school as far as it makes sense. Anything you want to add to that? No, he seemed interested, willing to work with us, and that <coughs> seems like a good anchor thing for helping your kids. Mm -hmm. You can tie in with that. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so, so I, I think he's on board. I think the superintendent's on board. And uh, his suggestion was that as we get more concrete proposals or suggestions or things that we want to do with the school district. Um, he said, bring, bring those concrete things to the board. And there's a lot of reshuffling and rejiggering with that particular board, pending lawsuits and all these sorts of things. So um, there's probably some opportunities there, but I think it's, it probably makes more sense to come to them with something concrete. The good news is we will have him and we will have the superintendent basically on our side when we're proposing these these things. So just to be clear, E-rate doesn't fund any construction, doesn't fund any infrastructure. It pays the bills for the libraries yeah, and Yeah, they have to do schools. their funding through E-rate. So yeah. you have to be an E-rate provider to get the money from the schools. Right. So that's that's what that does. So so it's it's useful to cultivate these because they're lucrative customers. Mm -hmm. yeah. But otherwise, they're not getting to build with their money. No, but, but one, one of the other things that, that we can consider <coughs> is that they may be also willing to host equipment and be hubs. This is something that we talked about there and he didn't run really screaming about, which can be nice because you may not want to have it hosted in the town office necessarily. Mm -hmm. It might make more sense, you know, Put some network equipment and have a you know have your maybe a head end really but whatever at Doty or whatever. Sounds good. Yeah. If I just as an aside, I, I'm not sure what you're looking at as far as E rate, but I'm an E rate consultant for schools. I know it's the state's first E rate. I looked consultant. at a web page and read some stuff. Okay. <laughs> give, me <laughs> give me a call or shoot me an email. I'll be glad to help you with anything. Yeah, I I wasn't sure how far we wanted to go down that road because it a lot depends on what we're going to be doing yeah. and and what kind of but it looked like quarterly reports and financial statements. And I'm like, okay, this is beyond what we're doing right now. So. Well, the schools, I, I know we, we've hired, we hired a consultant to do all that yeah. stuff. And, you know, That's why I get hired. Yeah. <laughs> because it just saves everybody so much time, effort, and money. Yeah. It's paying for the ISP, too. So, so I'll, I'll leave it up to you, Phil. If you decide that there's blood in the water, as it were, or it makes sense for us to go and pursue something related to that somehow, or if there's some value in uh, connecting up with schools, then you let us okay. know. Okay. Yeah. Um, Phil and I had a meeting with uh, RB Technologies in East Montpelier. Um, 
who are um, really interested in being uh, our operator um, have built and run and continue to run networks, including fiber networks, all the admin, a lot of the administration and physical stuff for um, Transvideo down in Northfield, the actual uh, fiber plant, not the, uh, not the cable stuff so much. Um, this is something that the, the, the owner of the company um, did as early as, um, let me see, 99, I think, I is think so. when, they, when they built that. So he, um, um, he's super interested, and they've got a, 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 nice, a nice office. They've got a, a good location. There was some talk about possible you know, uh, co-location of equipment there. Um, so, and uh, he's also interested in uh, us as a municipality, as a non, as a not-for-profit entity, and and seem to be willing to work with us, and, and not just be looking looking at us as a place to find revenue, which I was really encouraged by. He's also the chair of the East Montpelier School Board. And he, and he has been for a while, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. So yeah, he's really about giving to the community. So which is, well, I think, positive. The new Alton from Calus is probably an employee of the. Yeah. <clears throat> cool. So we might have a, a future possible conflict there or something like that. But <laughs> depending on the model we choose, we if, if we choose to go <laughs> kind of the EC fiber approach, um, the meeting that I had, the, the meeting that we had with RB, left me feeling very, very. Happy and good. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah, know if you have any feels there. Yeah, I agree. So, question: um, I initially thought you were meeting with them to see if they would be the network administrators, but you used the word operator. So, you're talking about being the ISP? Both. Both. Either. Mm -hmm. Both. Yeah. Some some combination. There was some flexibility. We just talked. To, we just talked tech. We talked about what what, what he's done, what they're doing right now. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, and we could simply contract with them to run things, and they seemed totally willing to do that. That's perfectly within their current business model. Mm -hmm. um, but he also seemed willing to do more engineering and possibly be, you know, take on that additional responsibility, yeah. being more like the ISP. And we just kind of <coughs> talked for, gosh, it ended up being more like an hour and a half meeting, yeah. I think. Yeah. So, um, so that's something else that we can explore. Um, Later, he has some information that he was supposed to. I think he was supposed to send to me. I have to follow up with him. That I, I haven't gotten it yet. That, I think that's more on me. Okay. Um, so that's my reports from various meetings. I don't think I met with anybody else since our last meeting. Um, any questions? Uh, Vermont telecommunications plan discussion. I unfortunately don't have my computer and a copy of that or my notes here. If anybody wants to talk about that, is there, is there anything that we need to? come back to this too. This is the second time we've sort of deferred this. Is this important? Do we need to go sent, through this? In the one packet you sent the 2014, but there's a 2018 final draft. Yeah. Okay. I think yeah. I sent the 2018 as well. Yeah, that's fine. I have the 2018. I just want to make sure. You can find it on, on ACCD's site. Yeah, or on, right. not ACCD's site. Oh, yeah. DPS. DPS, yeah. thank you. Oh, I mean, if you haven't read it, I mean, there's a small section on communication union districts that they think it's a good idea, and they, they sort of support it. It's a pretty weak, I mean, it's it's a it's sort of weak document because it doesn't have anything about implementation or funding or financing, and it's like, uh, okay, it goes halfway. It would be nice. But well, I, I it did does, it just says there isn't any. Yeah. Well, it doesn't even advocate, <laughs> that's my point. Um, I did submit testimony based on, based on my interest creating a GIS data set for the state of Vermont that has all the poles and wires and readily available to all of organizations. I'm sure we'll probably go on deaf ears, but at least it's my, my, my continuum of hard good. When I, set up, I was set up the state's GIS system in 1988, one of the data sets that was supposed to be created was the utility data set, and it just never got done because the funding for the state's GIS got cut in 92 when the, no longer was using the uh, property transfer tax to fund it. So anyway, hope still blooms eternal. So that sort of leads us into the, into the next item, uh, advocacy at the State House. There, is a, there seems to be a need for someone or several somebodies to get involved in some of the stuff that's going on at the State House. Um, 
and for the record, we're not paying. Um, so, um, but there are some things coming up about pull attachment rules, um, that revolving loan fund that was mentioned before, um, the question about uh, proprietary um, information, competitive information in open meetings and public records, and then something like, like this GIS data or this you know, poll information I think would be valuable not just to us but to other folks as well. Um, I wanted to get the sense, what everybody's sense of how that should work. I mean, I expect I'm going to be there anyways for several of these things in addition to some uh, privacy legislation that's coming up. Um, but any thoughts about who should be doing that or who expects to be there doing that or what CV Fiber's role ought to be in these things? Can, can you just explain <clears throat> whether we have any conflicts as a public entity <clears throat> <coughs> Excuse me. Regarding lobbying, I think um, maybe it's for Jim. I, I don't know, but I mean, you, usually municipalities lobby through an, or, a, a, an umbrella organization like the league, mm -hmm. or school boards advocate through the school boards association. But you'll have select board chairs or school board chairs go and testify too on behalf of the boards. For sure, we see by other yeah. people. The Williamstown yeah. School Board would actively uh, lobby on our own. Yeah, for some legislation too. It never got passed, but it did get introduced. So yeah, municipalities can do it on their own. Yeah, and, and you said uh, Carol goes, right? No, Irv. Irv does. Okay. The chair of the board goes, um, and I I have gone with Irv to lobby for things. Um, if if you go a lot, you have to <coughs> register as a lobbyist. It's a whole deal. But if you only go a couple times a year, you're just a citizen. They're happy to have you testify. They want to hear from people who aren't the professional lobbyists. I thought it was only if you got paid. I, I'm sure only. that's part of it. But I think if you go a lot, you may have to go to this as well. No, no we have somebody there, there almost full time for the Early Childhood I, Alliance. And I, I he's hold my yeah, legislators not a lobbyist. until their eyes bug up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, uh, sorry. So, so the, the telcos, you know, Verizon, AT and T, all those guys. They hire someone to be there every single day, mm -hmm. and we've shown up and gone to committees and advocated something, got some changes in the in the legislation. By the time it got through the whole sausage process, the professionals have changed it. Yeah. And so, the key is to know that process and to be able to touch base often enough to protect things that you want. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be glad to be part of it. One thing you can do too, um, I'm the treasurer for the Vermont Early Childhood Advocacy Alliance, and um, which is basically a coalition of people who care about early childhood issues. But um, we we have paid professional lobbyists before, but we have also done smaller contracts where we just pay someone to they just do monitoring. They don't do lobbying, and it's a lot cheaper. Um, I don't know that it's something that we would be in the position to do now, um, but then they can they go to all the committee meetings and they you know will text you like okay they're talking about this right now or they're going to be talking about this tomorrow and if you want to testify then you here's who you email and those kinds of things so that you can stay in communication that way and it's a little bit cheaper way to do it it's a lot cheaper way to do it. Might I suggest you uh, look into uh, whether a membership in the Vermont League of Cities and Towns would be worthwhile and what it would cost us because that would, uh, they offer that kind of service. They, um, they, they do, but only according to their own policy, their own adopted policy, which I was, uh, I was the, the Berlin delegate to the Vermont League's um, oh. so a little legislative policy um, process back in, I don't know whatever it was, November. Um, and they and they do that, and they have they have a lobbyist and a half, I think, that um, spends time there. Um, I have also asked about communications union districts becoming uh, members, and they said that they don't have any facility currently for a district like ours to join. It's really about oh, okay. city, cities and towns specifically. Um, they 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 seemed open to the possibility of. Um, you know, possibly as some, some sort of like associate member or something else for us to join and be, be a part of that. And I think later on when we have things like um, insurance or workers' comp or other things like that that we need to worry about, I think 
that's a great place for those sorts of things to go um, in the short term. I, I, I'm not sure that legislative advocacy is going to be um, okay. r r right to that, but that's. But thank you for bringing that up. Mm. Well, I'm willing to participate in any sessions that need to be attended to. The um, In reading the Times Argus this week, they had a piece on all the legislators in the Times Argus area and what their interests were. It was nobody that said broadband. Uh, I noticed that. About half of them talked about economic development. But uh, so it really is important that we talk to our representatives <laughs> to make ele elevate the. <coughs> so, 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 I mean, but one of the other things that would be good is if we had some like concrete policy positions so that if we do talk to our, our legislators or if somebody is you know, delegated from, you know, from this board to say, go in and say, this is the position of CV Fiber. This is something that we want to see happen. And maybe, maybe this meeting is too early for that for us to get anything nailed down. But I, I, think, I think something like, as simple as, you know, we support the creation of a broadband revolving loan fund. Mm -hmm. Do I do that right now? I mean, but I mean, yes. I mean, we could we could do that now. I, I maybe we want to have more concrete language and bring that back in February. But you know, the the budget's going to be proposed. What? When does the governor do that? Be another two weeks? Can we do action by email, collaborative email, or not? No. If you want, I mean. We can. Can we do it by website post, since it's publicly available to everybody? No. Not really. Okay. I mean, if we if we warned a meeting and I was sitting here, inviting public participation, and you were all on your computers at a certain window of time, and you're interacting through the web that way, you could you could probably make that work. You can't, but like, so you can't just post, hey, the committee on whatever is hearing tomorrow. We'll I can post that, and then people can show up. Or you can. That's, I mean, that's helpful, at least from a perspective of, you know, those mm -hmm. of us who are interested. No, I mean, that's a communication that's public. I mean, it's public knowledge. Everybody. Yeah, I mean, so if you, if you're broadcasting you know. information, it's not becoming a discussion. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. I, I could say, yeah, I heard from this legislator that they're taking this up tomorrow at one. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think we could send those around. Mm -hmm. but I. That alone, I think, would be that helps. I don't know how much, especially if we get more people interested and are also going to the website besides ourselves, because from an advocacy perspective, you know, it's not, yeah, I guess that's what I was thinking. Um, um, so back to the other thing that we were saying about knowing what our stances are. The revolving fund thing, pretty clear cut where our stance would be on that whole attachment rules, I don't know how esoteric those are. And I don't know if maybe I might get stuck in some wording. I may not know what those things are. But if I have talking points, if I have an understanding, but I don't know what the wording is, I don't sure. know what any of that is, I'm totally willing to talk to my representatives. I no longer have any time to go to the legislature. I'm, I am out of time now. So um, I'd have to work something out. But um, I'm totally happy to talk to them, and I would like to hit all of these points. I would like to address specific regulation or legislation that's coming up before them and say, this is how I think you should respond to this based on this information. And there, there are two of them I can talk to. One of them never calls me back anymore. Um, but you know, I do have a relationship with my representatives in a way. So I would, I would like to do that, but I need guidance on that because I don't know the answers. Or do we join with EC Fiber and have one of those Cedar Creek, Cedar Creek room press conferences and say, <laughs> and we have a day or a time where we go and say, here's this, here's something that, you know, here are the things that we care about. The normal way of doing that I've noticed is a lot of people take the card, so-called card room mm -hmm. in between the mm -hmm. hall and the uh, cafeteria and uh, set up a display and sort of say, what are your major issues? And, you try and buttonhole people as they're coming past for the day to get you sort of do an so ongoing education. So those Communications the, Union District Day. Those might be booked already, but yeah, yeah it's hard, hard to say. Yeah, but I think that is a good idea to work with other CEDs. You know, Earth Tornado would probably love to do something 
like a CUD day at the State House. Or, um, I mean, the idea is we, we don't have to have <coughs> five CUDs to do this. Just the idea alone kind of sells the, mm -hmm. sells the notion. And I, I think economic development, but especially rural economic development, is emerging as an issue in the State House this year. I've heard oh, it's a huge people. issue. Right? That's why I said you, <coughs> yeah. if you, 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 you make it your headline, uh, you know, m moving our economy into the 21st right. century. You know? Right. Yeah, I think people, not, not to be negative about Montpelier, but I think, Montpelier, I think people are less following, they're following the parking garage, but I, I don't think people are looking at the downtown parking garage in Montpelier as the number one economic development <laughs> challenge in Washington County. Well, it's not. It's economic like suck. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Um, I, think, I think it is a saleable issue, and a number of young legislators who are coming in are really interested in broadband yeah. and rural issues. So. so what's our next step? Agenda item for policy positions at the next meeting, or...? Do you talk with her on a regular basis? Not on a regular basis. I mean, if we exchange emails once every... Been four months, I think, since the last. Do you want me to write them and ask them if they're planning anything in the state house in terms of general information? <laughs> um, the, and and there is, I, I I think there is a little bit un underway. If I if I heard secondhand from Carol that that was the case. Okay. But I think they were looking more at what were they talking about? More like what poll attachments, Polls. weren't it? Do, do you want me to quickly say something about polls? Please, please. Um, the the problem with polls isn't that they're there, it isn't who owns them, it isn't that we get to attach to them, it is how long it takes. And right now, there are rules, the Public Service Board, Public Utility Commission rules, called 3.70 rules, that determine the process of applying for licenses to attach, making making uh, going through a process of surveying them with the poll owners to determine whether they're ready to be attached to or need to be made ready by moving cables up and down on the poles or replacing them with taller ones and then the process of doing that make ready and getting it done at which time the licenses are issued the poll owners in different parts of the state want usually the poles are jointly owned by the phone company and the electric utility, except in Washington Electric Territory, where they're solely owned by Washington Electric. Um, the poll owners, there's usually at least one of them that drags its feet for many possible reasons, and we won't talk about their motivations or their constraints, but the fact is that they can take a very long time beyond the statutory periods. And there are even a few penalties written into the the rules, but they are not enforced. And um, so EC Fiber has experienced extreme delays. We experienced extreme delays. They were very costly for both organizations. And we want either some kind of enforcement teeth put into the regulations or more, uh, or an alternative where if they don't meet certain time limits, we are allowed to go out and get go to a um, um, approved uh, contractor to go, to go do the make ready for the utility, build the utility for that. <coughs> they in turn would charge us because we have to pay for it, but it would be done. And so take it out of their hands if they go beyond certain time limits. So that's the sort of changes to the regulations that are under discussion. So um, Alan's going to talk to Irv. Do we want to have a policy position discussion? I mean, this sort of takes our one of our back burner items off of uh, the back burner, net neutrality. I don't expect, I don't think there's anything coming up from the legislature about that in particular. Correct me if I'm wrong, if anybody else knows more. But I think at least that Somebody at the state has said that they're going to backpedal on that for a while because of uh, national issues and waiting to see how, I think it was the Attorney General. I'm not sure. Hmm. I mean, okay. we already have uh, the governor did something. I did an executive order, but right. I don't think they want to do legislation yet. Well, they already did. I'm saying if they're going to change their position. I don't think they're going to, I don't think they want to mess with it at all right now. Okay. So, what what makes the most sense going forward, or do we just kind of all engage in this individually as we 
like to and sort of shoot out emails when we know things are happening that might be of interest to other board members. I would suggest the policies. I, I mean, because if you're going to go in there and say, yeah, I'm, I'm working with this group, pick your name. You ought to be able to re be representing what that group, as opposed to any one individual, is saying. You know, I, which wouldn't, I, I, I mean, I don't think that precludes any of us from going in and saying, yes, this is the position of CV. I guess our, our, I, I keep saying Central Ron Internet. Should we be using the phrase CV fiber? Yes, we absolutely should. Okay, so I, I'm in here. I, I'm CV Fiber needs A, B, and C. That's what you need the policy for. Yeah. Rama Schneider thinks this really, this thing sucks, and this should be done. You know, I don't need your policy statements for that. As long as we make sure we draw the distinctions, which can be difficult to do, you just got to really make sure that you're very upfront about who you're talking for. But I think. Some policy. I, I know. Listen, I, I don't know how often right now that I could get up to the state house, but I love going up there. And I, I love doing the lobbying type work. It, it's actually a lot of fun. Um, if I were to have some talking points, and I were to get a blast, or I mean, I try to watch the schedules to, to see. But if I had some inkling of when to get up, if I could get up and I could go with some talking points, I know I, as an individual, am pretty effective. <coughs> At, at the end of, at the one on one lobbying, but I don't want to do it without talking points because this general topic is one I could get lost and not be doing a good job. I, I like that we're talking about this and that's an agenda item. I wonder if it just should be a continuing agenda item uh, for next time, and uh, because then we can individually report on what we've heard uh, from our representatives about. Uh, what's going on in the state house? But I like your point about talking points too. That that I think that would be useful. And so I wonder who in this group or what committee mm -hmm. uh, could provide us with talking points. So, I, Michael, I bet you could put some talking points together about pull attachments. Would you be able to put just? Well, to, we could work with with Carol and with Bert. And, and I'm, I'm sure they would have something there too. Yeah, that would be maybe that would be even better because I'm sure they're going to go up there armed with that information too. I think we could just support their position probably, but we should see it. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, um, <clears throat> when Michael and I met with Janet Ansel, who's on the Ways and Means Committee, it has nothing to do with anything we're doing, but she does vote. And so if there is an issue that is up for a vote, she'd like to know how we feel about it. And so I just want to pass that on, that some of your members will not be on committees that deal with any of this stuff, but they will be voting on things. Um, <coughs> GIS data, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know if there's anything upcoming in this legislative session that would that would cover that, but I mean, that certainly um, would make our job here a lot easier. And having that as part of a package of policy statements, I think makes makes sense. So, so if, if you could write something like that up, I think it's, I don't I don't know I don't know what would be most useful in that sense. I I, I know the data is is not there, and I know the data would be useful, but having a bit more. Um, a bit more flexibility getting at that data would be would be helpful I think and then for the um, the open meetings I have I yeah I can I can work something up for that and that in the, the revolving loan unfortunately we don't know what that's going to look like just yet so it might probably be better to wait until that's proposed or out there and I don't know. the open meeting I, and, and don't go into great detail I'm just kind of because you mentioned it and so what are, what are you envisioning as something that's needed in the open meeting? Well, this is something that, I, that I've pitched in the past and, and we've, we've talked about. The, the idea that um, we are a competitive entity. Oh, about but, the information. Okay. Yeah, but, yeah, but we're a competitive public entity, so sure. having competitive information being exempt from disclosure. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Christine Hoffman, last time she was here, talked about legislation, so I think potentially putting forward, do we want to have a position on, on that legislation? <laughs> it, is a, it is a good question. Um, um, me personally, there, there, there wasn't really anything that, that she brought up that I remember saying, yes, that's something that I'm going to hitch my wagon to, personally. Well, that's just me. Anybody else? 
There's the with the utility mandate was one thing yeah. she talked about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing a whole lot of vacuum. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm in favor of anything that uh, asks the utilities to do more for the public entities like ours. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think we're going to hear from WEC at their, at their board meeting, and I'm ho ho hoping to come out with a kind of a more partnership model rather than a like, thou shalt model. I mean, yes, the legislative legislature has the right to you know beat them into submission. I just don't think that that's, I personally don't think that's the right way to go about it. And yet they haven't done it. They've had 20 years to do something, and they still have it. But is it the, is it the electric the utility's way. purpose to build up broadband? Well, no, but why not? It, 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 the whole, I, I guess the whole issue of whose responsibility it is is separate from, is this a public good? Is this something that should be considered a utility that is for the public good now, the way electricity is now? And, and so that's, you know, that's a decision that still needs to be made, and I don't see the electric companies making a decision about that. That's something that needs to be made on a state level. So that was a decision that was already made at the federal level, that we have to work within the confines of, of those rules, where internet is not regulated the same way as electric utilities. And there's not that much that you can do at the state level, which is how you need to still kind of color within the lines to make that happen. I think. Vermont, via EC Fiber and their advocacy, decided that the Communications Union District was one of the ways where we could create a sort of utility model to go forward in this, in the absence of one of the existing electric utilities taking ownership and doing this. Um, Belco has built out a lot of fiber. Not, they're not building out fiber to the home, as far as I, as far as I know. Um, but the, the meeting with WEC, I think, will maybe give us some more insight in terms of how much they want to <coughs> cooperate with us to building fiber to the home. And I think it's looking interesting. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the issue with electricity utilities right now in terms of climate change and <coughs> managing you know, consumption in your home, they need fiber. So it looks like it could be a good collaborative mm -hmm. venture. Right. Okay, so anything else about uh, advocacy or policy? Just put this on the agenda for next time. Okay. Yeah. Hearing vacuum, I'll go forward with that. Um, review back burner items, committee assignments, and memberships. Do we need to add any more people to committees, take them off, um, give them things to do? Or are we pretty well set? Are you ready for purchasing policy yet? Mm. Are we at that point? I would recommend not a, not going down that until you feel as though it's time and we know what the issues would be. You know, make a policy in anticipation of things that may or may not happen. But if you feel as though you're close, we've got some money in the bank, mm -hmm. maybe it's time to start thinking about the rules on which we will spend mm -hmm. that, which, under which we will spend that. Okay. Anybody did, think? Didn't the Finance Committee propose general guidelines initially? I think that's different from what's but being discussed. I think we're talking about bidding procedures, yeah, yeah. Okay. which is different from oversight and being able to yeah. sign okay. off on those. So, but there, but there will be, um, assuming, oh, oh, so here's something else. I, uh, I heard back from, um, from ACCD about the grant proposal that I wrote. There were, um, there, there were a lot of submissions and a lot from um, groups that I, I wouldn't have expected to put in submissions, but they said they will have uh, more information for us and basically a thumbs up or thumbs down by the end of January. Mm -hmm. So if uh, if we get that, um, we will have to be ready, we'll have to write an RFP. So I don't know if that makes, if that's the sort of thing that we're not jumping the gun, maybe we should have, be writing the RFP at the same time as we are approving a purchasing policy. That, so, so maybe, so maybe we ought to ask the policy committee to go and grab that. Okay. The, 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 the league has a really good. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Was that the Think Vermont Innovation Grant? Yes. Okay. Yes. Do we need a motion to ask the committee to work on that, or can we just second? Okay. <laughs> any any further discussion? 
Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Extensions? Okay, motion passes. <laughs> <laughs> Snuck that in there, huh? Okay, uh, any other so, back order items or so, stuff? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the what was the, the motion? The policy committee <laughs> the to policy develop committee. a, pur a purchasing okay. policy. Policy. Procurement. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Sure. Um, approval of December 11th meeting minutes. I did have a couple minor changes from Michael that I forgot to send out. Um, most one of, of it. One of which we need to change back because change I, back, right. I, I mischaracterized the meeting with RB. Oh, okay. Oh, right. Okay. I see that. So I'll change that back. Okay. Um, so the changes were um, in the report back. It reports back from various meetings um, when, in the paragraph about Central Vermont Economic Development Corp, um, to explore grants, it should be loans, not grants. And it's um, a, the revolving loan fund provided through a grant to CVEDC by the USDA is for building infrastructure, not planning. Um, and then same strike grants and replace with loan. And then um, it was just updating the additional people that went to some of the meetings. So it was Hanson, Birnbaum, and Ken Jones, correct? Mm -hmm. That went to the Connectivity Summit in Westover, not Brattleboro. Um, and Hanson and Birnbaum met with Bill Powell. And I think then that was it. There was a mention of um, ReadyNet, which may have been on, the, on that same thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's spelled R E D I. Oh, okay. N E T. Rather than R E A D Y. That change as well. Okay, anybody else have any changes? So I'm going to move that we approve the December 11th meeting minutes with the previously noted changes. Second. Okay. Seconded by Michael. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Stay. Oh, it was on one abstention. Sorry, yeah. jumped, jumped again there. Okay, uh, round table. We'll start Actually, well, before you do that, well, um, Magellan, can I mention that that's in the offing for next meeting? So, mention it. Okay, so just as we invited uh, Chris Campbell from Tilson to come present, uh, next meeting we're going to have somebody from Magellan advisors, I forget what they're Partners, Part advisors. Magellan Partners, Sherry McCullough, she's from North Carolina. Hmm. She has worked um, extensively on um, rural fiber projects with co-ops and municipalities for a whole career. And she has worked in Vermont for the Vermont Telecommunications Authority for a couple of years before it was disbanded. She worked with Chris and others. Um, hmm. And so she is going to present something similar to Tilson, but not the same, no doubt. <laughs> so that'll be next, next month. Thank you so much. Okay, awesome. So we can call that your, your round table contribution. Sure. I think I've done enough talking. Thank you. Yeah, I just, you, you know, it's um, vision takes perseverance and it takes discipline. So when the guy sits up there and says, you know, five to ten years out before you're really going to see a result, that's fine. It's just a matter of we have to have the discipline and the perseverance to see it through because that's the time it's going to really take. No, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just going to add that when I did the treasurer's report, we also just got $700 in checks today. So. Oh, so what do we have to so now we're up to four thousand eight hundred ten dollars and forty three cents. I'm good too. Um, I just wanted to say that I, I didn't expect to hear what I heard from from Chris, um, and it, it got me kind of excited. It really is a very different approach than, than I think we've been discussing a long time. And a lot to uh, a lot to think about a lot of possibilities. Pass. Um, I'd just like to say that I, I really I really liked Chris's presentation as well. I really uh, 
from the mind to, to a lot of different ideas that we could possibly look at. And I'm actually really looking forward to the other presentation coming up just to see of other alternatives that, that we might be able to take. And I, I think at some point we need to, after we've seen enough of these presentations, we're, we're really going to need to sit down with the board and decide what direction we really think we need to head in. I think the presentations are great. They're really helpful, I think, for all of us, even if we disagree with people. I mean, I'm always getting ideas, even when I don't think it's a good one that the person is proposed. <laughs> one more word. What's that? One more word. Um, <laughs> I've always thought of Tilson as a very expensive solution. Mm -hmm. uh, I still invited Chris to come here. I was really impressed with his creative solution. I don't know if we can afford it, but it is really worth thinking about. Okay. I'm going to move to the chair. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I need you for two questions. Okay.